Thank you very much for your very kind introduction and, and for the opportunity, the privilege of being here. Um, we're hoping in a moment that my presentation will be available to you as well as, <coughs> as, well as to me. But my subtitle, which is a long one, was, has just gone. No. <laughs> How, no, carry I, I, on. Read, read, read. Sorry, Go, you carry on. I, I no, just, no. Um, Just one thing it's, it's really about how a charter for sustainable oceans and fisheries, supported by a travelling exhibition called Fish, Fishing and Fishing Dependent Communities, could actually give the Commonwealth a sense of identity and a sense of purpose, a new one. Um, we heard from Michael Lake that uh, you know, the, the Commonwealth lacks that sort of focus, the sharp end, if you like, at present. And we think that there is... Uh, an issue begging to be taken up by the Commonwealth with its maritime history, with the number of countries that suffer from illegal fishing and other problems around, around oceans and fisheries, and with the number of small island states involved. I have recently returned from uh, the SIDS, the Small Island Developing States meeting in Samoa, from which I had a couple of, or have a couple of slides but I'd like you to enjoy them too. Um, and I think I'll, okay, I'll just carry on without the overheads. We have a, a, a global map of the Commonwealth. If, if you want, you could take the no, stick. Yeah, I'm putting it here as well, so we will have it in the two places. Great, okay. Sorry. Um, if it's only two places at once, that's fine. Um, but, we, we nearly had three Commonwealth heads of government, oh, excellent, thank you, um, Commonwealth heads of government meeting in, in, on the Indian Ocean, uh, 2011 in Perth, 2013 in Sri Lanka, and 2015 was due to be Mauritius. Mauritius declined because of ho the holding of the 2013 meeting in Sri Lanka on uh, human rights. The Mauritius uh, declined on human rights grounds, but if we can, yes, go to the second, the next slide. Thanks. OK, a map of one of many versions of maps of the Commonwealth. But this happens to point out in blue the, the small island states that are characteristic of the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth has a very strong, oh, thank you, reputation, I think at least, the secretary, the official Commonwealth, but also the unofficial Commonwealth. Is that, I press the little right button for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The green, one. the green one in the middle. Are you down there? Yeah. OK, with you, thanks. Um, and so we thought, OK, the third chogum on the Indian Ocean would be the time to really develop this theme of sustainable oceans and fisheries. In fact, Malta <coughs> stepped up. Malta, which really kicked off the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to host the meeting next year instead. So we're really happy. If there had to be a substitute for Mauritius, then Malta is an excellent one. And let me see if I can. OK, Commonwealth members, we're familiar with, the, with, with the, the British colonial legacy, if you like, or the longer term Danish colonial legacy, if you, you think back a thousand years to when Denmark ran, <laughs> ran Britain. But we have new joiners, Mozambique, Cameroon, Rwanda, so there are attractions in the Commonwealth which make it sensible for some countries, they think, to join. The Commonwealth, some people have suggested Ireland and Burma and South Sudan might, might join. Then we have something of an anomaly. This group at the bottom, the island territories of the UK, and there are similar territories or dependencies of New Zealand and Australia. Uh, all of these are island territories. So if you look at what the Commonwealth is, has, what makes up the Commonwealth, it's largely marine. Um, is it to toggle back in? OK, I think I'm getting the hang of it. Now, I think there's also an important issue about nation branding, and that is, if a country wants to belong to the Commonwealth, why does it want to belong to the Commonwealth? 
And I think the Commonwealth has to then step up to the plate and provide something useful. It's good if you're a Commonwealth member state from the point of view of cult shared culture, values, democracy, human rights, and so on. Also, more recently, commitments to sustainability, environmental sustainability, and sustainable livelihoods, and support for small island states in the UN system. So the Commonwealth does provide a special benefit to members of the small island states, at least. Now, recently, so we have largely maritime nations. I was told by the Secretariat uh, well, if we just focus on sustainable oceans, that rules out the six landlocked countries. But if you look at the map of Africa, a number of the Commonwealth's landlocked countries are actually bordering on uh, freshwater lake resources and have quite large fishing communities and get a lot of their, their protein from, from fish. Uh, there are major developments in ocean voyaging, the Pacific voyagers, Polynesian voyagers, going in the wakas or the, the catamarans sailing around the Pacific to raise awareness of climate change issues. So again, culture, tradition, almost sport or sport, sailing, and also uh, boat racing. Part of culture delivering a message on sustainability, but delivering a message for the Commonwealth which should reflect beneficially on member states of the Commonwealth. So does a member state of the Commonwealth think of the Commonwealth and its membership of the Commonwealth as part of its brand? I, we may want to discuss that. But can the Commonwealth be more than the, the sum of its parts? Why stay? Why join? Well, I've mentioned some of that. There's also the importance of the regional Commonwealth. A number of the new joiners join because they want to be part of regional conversations when all their neighbouring finance ministers say a meeting at the Commonwealth Finance Ministers' meeting and the voice at the UN. Why oceans and fisheries? Well, will this, this one will pick up as well, thanks. Um, oceans and fisheries are in crisis. We have climate change, sea level rise, fish migrating into cooler waters, ocean acidification, overfishing, illegal, unreported and unregulated IUU fishing, in which Commonwealth states are usually the trespassed against rather than the trespassing, or the sinned against rather than the sinning. So there's a hope that the Commonwealth nations can be on moral, the moral high ground sometimes. Sometimes the moral high ground seems to be sinking very rapidly in a literal sense, but we will, well, I won't overdo the metaphors. Coastal urbanization is posing problems for coastal fisheries and, and resources. Piracy, the lack of an evidence base for policy is something that we could do something about. And of course, if oceans, fisheries, and the reefs are in crisis, then you have a threat to the tourist industry. Looking on the brighter side, what about the opportunities? Well, we've got the Chogum coming up in Malta. Malta also hosts the International Ocean Institute, who would be our partners in this. There's an opportunity for the Commonwealth to make a major global contribution also to the SDGs and the post-2015 agenda, which will be agreed by September 2015, so that by the time we get to Chogham in October, November 2015, that will be time for Commonwealth member states to step up to the plate and say what they're going to do to implement the oceans and fisheries components of the post-2015 agenda that you, the UN General Assembly will agree, we hope, in September 2015. Um, so we plan to raise awareness and support implementation of the Oceans and Fisheries Agenda with a small-scale fisheries conference at Malta and a travelling exhibition. And I've men mentioned the more sinned against than sinning. Um, I don't mean to sound smug in that, but, but it's just... Where is the Commonwealth's comparative advantage? That might be part of it. Um, the Commonwealth has a strong track record in SIDS, in helping delineate maritime boundaries, in negotiating on occasion maritime boundaries, for example, between Belize and, and Guatemala. We did some work in Belize on fisheries. And I produced a map that the Belizean fishers had, had given us 
saying where they fished and where there were illegal incursions from Guatemala, Guatemalan fishers, and I was told, put that map away, you'll set back diplomacy in the region for by 25 years. So, you know, cultural diplomacy, you can also set things back if you bring the wrong message, because it was saying where the Guatemalan fishers were fishing. Belize thinks it's their territory, Guatemala thinks it's their territory. And so that's a sort of the negative ex uh, example, if you like. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just looking around at the clock now and again. Um, but in Trinidad, the Chogham Communique recognized the need for urgent action on this uh, issue. In Perth, we secured a declaration on food security principles, which, in, which raised fisheries to about the same level as agriculture. Very amazing. We thought that was a great achievement. And that, we've just run a side event at the SIDS meeting in Samoa, promoting a blue economy for the Commonwealth, building on, really, the Seychelles initiative in, in that area. And the Seychelles Foreign Minister, Jean-Paul Adam, gave a really persuasive presentation at that meeting. So fisheries can be a positive sum gain for Commonwealth nations and an identifiable niche for the Commonwealth. Um, the UK, New Zealand, Australia and Canada have signed up in principle to the notion of a uh, coordinated set of marine protected areas in most cases all the way around their coast. And so I've just put some illustrations in here. I'm going to move on, but the, if we think of the Chagos no Take Marine Reserve, 640,000 square kilometers, and Kamadek, New Zealand, which they're trying to make a no take reserve at the moment, I think, 748,000 square kilometers. So some of the biggest marine reserves in the world are Commonwealth marine reserves. What would we do at the conference? We try and highlight the hidden benefits of small-scale fisheries to social cohesion. That is, if you rub out, if you have bottom trawling, which takes out the ecosystems in the inshore area, that means industrial fishing can destroy the basis for small-scale fishing, and that in turn can undermine social cohesion. Uh, Somalia was the first country to go through rapid depletion of its fishery in the 1950s, and obviously it took a long time for that to become piracy, but there is a possible causal link there. If the livelihoods of, of coastal communities disappear, what do they do? We also want to look at the cultural traditions of fishers and voyagers, um, voyaging, navigating in the Pacific for the last 16,000 years, and voyagers who train as part of a family or a community group, but learn to navigate both by the stars and by the shape of the waves. And they're just quite remarkable skills. Um, we hope to integrate Caribbean Pacific and Ames countries, so the SIDS groups across the world. And I've mentioned the uh, post-2015 agenda. And we think that a Commonwealth Charter for Sustainable Oceans and Fisheries would help crystallize this uh, initiative. Um, now, that was the conference. And I, I can talk a lot more about the conference. Uh, probably won't have the chance to speak a lot more at it. Um, but we then move on, and this is where we have a style shift in a moment, to the exhibition. It should travel across Commonwealth SIDS. There will be a parallel virtual exhibition. We need about five stories, fisher folk narratives. In most of the Pacific Islands, there is a kind of Jonah and the whale equivalent narrative. Um, we then have themes around uh, successful uh, marine reserves, marine protected areas, around navigation, and around cultural artifacts, as well as around traditional knowledge. We're working, the Commonwealth Human Ecology Council in this is working with the Commonwealth Association of Museums to pull this together. And we have treasures of oral histories and artifacts. And I'll be in Bristol Monday and Tuesday 
trying to find out what they still have of the remnants of the Commonwealth Museum, which used to be at Bristol Temple Mead Station, was given to Bristol Museum, which has been, is being dispersed throughout their separate collections. But there was a slight problem that a lot of the artifacts from the Commonwealth Museum went missing, um, and the person who sold them claimed he had permission of his trustees to do the sales, but people started seeing Commonwealth artifacts turning up in uh, antique dealers in, in London. That's when the alarm bells started to go off. There's, so the voyagers I've mentioned, there is the culture of co coastal communities. We want to bring together science and policy in oceans and fisheries with cultural issues, arts, the marine imaginary, it's where culture and science meet. Um, we then use this to build awareness and concern in communities because policymakers know there's, there's an important issue here, but not every person living in a small island state who's still eating fish, maybe less of it as time goes on, is aware of the, the global issue of oceans and, and fisheries. And so we want to have I'll just quickly, I recently visited and talked to curators of some international exhibitions on whales in New Zealand. The whales or the Tohora exhibition is now traveling globally. Te Papa Wellington had a colossal squid exhibition. And if you remember the Kraken myth, when you see a squid sort of laid out in a museum about that of three meters of it, you suddenly realize where sailors get their myths from. And of course we have the mermaids or the dugong or whatever. So you know, some of this is culture and, and science come together. Um, UNESCO at the SIDS meeting was promoting its underwater heritage exhibition. So there is also now the theme of protecting underwater heritage wrecks cities and so on, Atlantis, maybe one day. Um, at the SIDS meeting, we also had voyagers, the Hokulau, who'd sailed from, now was it Hawaii to, to Samoa, just to make, again, this point of climate change, weather, but use culture, use sailing to bring home a message. And the Polynesian Voyaging Society, I don't know if if I click on this, it probably won't bring up the... Um. No, let, let's... I'll move on, but if, if this goes onto the web, maybe people would then be able to, uh, to access the different web pages for... Um, I seem to now have closed this one down. Let me... Just this. Okay. This was the Tates of Rise Aquatopia, the imaginary of, of the ocean deep last year. Um, there's some really beautiful stuff to be had here. We have to think in this exhibition how we bring in children as well as adults. Um, okay, so this will be a traveling Commonwealth exhibition in a converted shipping container with a parallel virtual exhibit. So we have the traveling exhibition which could be self-contained, self-supporting, and when we get to a country, we can then add an empty container so that the, the, the country we're visiting can produce its own exhibit, and that can then form the core of a long-term marine exhibit. So we're building museum capacity at the same time. Um, you can see here some, some ways that containers are being changed. If anybody goes home and starts, uh, starts taking an angle grinder to a container, I'll be really delighted to, to find that, but you, you can make uh, really quite interesting exhibition spaces, and obviously you, you fold it all up, put it in the container, take it to the next island, which is the idea. <coughs> we have to focus a bit on the way fishing has defined cultures over time. Uh, again, in Samoa, uh, going to the, the Museum of Samoa, I, I saw some of the carvings, uh, some beautiful work carvings on, on boats, for example, that, that show the link between the art and the economy there. New technologies, invasive species, threatens livestock. Now, so we want to deal with the marine imagination. Again, 
the old man and the sea, obviously, Moby Dick, we think we can bring alive. Treasure Island, Robert Louis Stevenson, the Robert Louis Stevenson Museum is on Samoa, so I was able to go, go and see that and stand by his chair and his desk. And I thought, here is the man who wrote Treasure Island and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I, do, I wonder about which part of the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was the marine part. I'm not, not sure. Then we have Aboriginal art or the Turner exhibition or the Japanese artist Kaniyoshi. You know, the, the way that, that the marine has been depicted in art, myth and mor reality, and then culture, fisherman identities. And, oh, sorry, this one's lost, lost its title in translation. But at the same time, on one side of the container, we would have the art and culture. On the other side, we would have science and policy. And somewhere in the middle, the two will meet, hence the dugong or the kraka. We could have done not quite the shark in formaldehyde. We could have a minnow sort of dangling in the middle and an empty container, but we thought that would be less educational, although probably a useful metaphor for what's happening to, to fisheries. Um, plastics in the sea, lack of data, um, species decline, dead zones, threats to livelihoods, which is really important in this context. Uh, then pulling in a number of marine artifacts, the ones that do most damage, as opposed to the ones that can be fished with sustainably. And someone in Samoa gave me a book of 80 different kinds of uh, rod and line and gears to, to catch fish that are part of traditional fishing culture. You, you look at each of these, you know, you have the, the shark rattle, which is lots of coconut shells, and you rattle it in the water, and that draws the sharks, if, <laughs> as long as they're in the boat. Um, and then different fishing boats, fishing technologies. I'm going through these quite fast because many people nowadays are aware of the threats to fisheries and the issues. Um, in the Commonwealth Fisheries Program, which ran from 2008 to 2010, we profiled different communities in Belize, Sierra Leone, Fiji, and South Africa. We found that each community is unique, but the lessons from each community can be built into a cumulative knowledge base, rather along Eleanor Ostrom's lines of giving frames of reference to those of you who are involved in political science or um, work like that. So we have elements of engagement Local issues seen in an international context. The host community is encouraged to add local content so that you have a dialogue, if you like, between the global and the local. An online presence, uh, which would have, so we'd have a virtual exhibition at the same time, and you would also be able to track on GPS the container as it moves around the world, just as you can track the Hokalau, the Pacific voyagers, you can track where they are on GPS if you go onto the website, see the progress they're making. Um, and then develop links between communities. Just a couple of pictures towards, towards the end. Museum of Samoa. During the meeting, and I can't find the, the slide for it, this on the other side was painted with, you have to picture a huge whale rising out of the ocean on the side wall of this. You can't see it from this angle. Um, so, sorry about that. A waka on display, the traditional boat is almost universal in Pacific uh, museum displays. This is Robert Louis Stevenson's room, a room in his, his, in the museum. It's a wonderful place to visit and really redolent of, of his work. This is a visit with uh, Samo and the Samoan Fishing Division who at the time were doing their national inspection for the, this is one of the pictures of the inspection of their marine reserves for the agriculture show, which was gonna happen in October. But we're looking for narratives, we're looking for stories, and this might be one of our stories, because these marine reserves are watched over by the local community, they're adopted by the local community, and they work. So, this is a, a sort of policy innovation that works, but it builds on the cultural history. And that's what the sea washed up and uh, 
next next to it, a sort of uh, yeah, a sculpture. This was at the Hope Conference in Brussels in March. A sculpture made of marine debris. Uh, I don't know what sort of sea monster it is, but uh, just to bring home the message of how much junk is going into the sea. Again, the way that culture can help help to bring home the message. So, in conclusion, we can build on the Samoa SIDS meeting. I'm not going to risk going to the website for this, but we did push the notion of the Commonwealth for a blue economy. And I think that is where a selling point of the Commonwealth resides and where the member states of the Commonwealth would actually feel proud or more proud to be members of that organisation if it was really making a difference on that front. We also launched a partnership on education in small states built on 20 years of, of experience at, at the University of Bristol, uh, which is trying to bring in different levels of education institution into working with us on the exhibition, but also on appropriate research and development of training for fisher folks. And at the Malta Chogum and beyond. So either we, we get all this to work, or. So that's the. So it's a little bit of tongue in cheek conclusion, but that was a rather nice artwork in, I think, uh, the Sydney Art Gallery that I got to on the way to Samoa. And I think somebody had the same idea as we did if we don't act now on this front and use culture as, as, as a vehicle, then we might as well start swimming.